So uh, welcome to the Rethinking Civilization uh, video podcast. Uh, we're here with Brett Hennig, who's the co-founder of the Sortition Foundation and uh, one of the world's leading thinkers on citizen assemblies. Uh, the Global Partnership for Civic Engagement, uh, which I founded a little over a year and a half ago, is an organization devoted to identifying systemic innovation uh, in solving uh, the world's uh, greatest challenges and finding out ways to scale them up. Um, we are also very committed to the idea that we cannot uh, solve the world's problems without getting the world's people on board to that process. It seems obvious, but it hasn't really been tried. And um, so we think that when you have a situation like now, which I think is akin to today's civilization being like the Titanic, and we're heading towards not just one iceberg, but a bunch of icebergs, and we know we don't have a lot of time, um, in those kind of emergency situations, uh, there's a logic to an emergency. And the logic to an emergency is that you have to prioritize on the crisis at hand. You have to identify what are the best strategies, options, and solutions. Then you sift through those and pick the best ones, the ones you think are the best ones. Um, and then you try to scale them up as quickly as possible. There's a logic. That logic is used in all emergency situations. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. Um, in those situations, the if you think about, uh, again, the, the uh, ship idea again, uh, the best thing to do as well is all hands on deck. That is what people call for those emergency situations. You don't want people going about their normal business and disrupting the process of trying to address the emergency. Um, so we're very committed to that, and thus the name of the organization, the Global Partnership for Civic Engagement. Not so much local and national civic engagement in the traditional sense, but global civic engagement. Um, we believe that that is necessary. Um, we are doing that uh, through the Rethinking Civilization Awards process for identification in the 10, what we think are the 10 major areas of civilization, giving awards in uh, for existing programs and for new ideas, two awards per category, existing and new, newly proposed. Um, and we're also uh, setting up our 21st Century Philanthropy Initiative uh, to get the necessary funding to help these uh, award honorees scale up as quickly as possible, whether they're already known and well-supported or, or uh, uh, haven't been on anyone's, uh, many people's radar. Um, so, one of the things that is very important to us is uh, getting a deep and broad understanding of the situation that we face now. Uh, it is clear that uh, in the realm of politics and government as one of the key pillars of civilization, it determines so much about what strategies we choose, which strategies get the backing they need, uh, at what scale, and um, it also, in some sense, uh, can give people cynicism and skepticism about politics and also give people hope. Uh, but also people can tend to view the way things have always been done as the way things will always be. And uh, politics and institutions are fluid. They haven't been that fluid um, uh, in, in recent years because there's been a... Um, uh, I believe a, a, an equivalence to uh, supporting existing institutions um, as a form of honoring the principles behind those institutions. Uh, so for example, uh, if the impulse to create certain institutions was democratic, then to tinker with those institutions would be perceived as anti-democratic. And that's not necessarily the case. We know many instances in world history where the goal is to strengthen existing institutions or to add new features uh, to uh, government so that we can get closer to the original goal. 
we have a situation now where the uh, a large percentage of the world's population is disenchanted for various reasons with with their government. Um, one of the reasons that we uh, are have as our motto for this organization, rethinking civilization together, uh, is we think that when you say to most people, do you think civilization needs rethinking, that uh, they might have different prescriptions, but most people say yes, at least to some degree. So it's a ripe moment too. It's a ripe moment because of necessity, but it's also a ripe moment in terms of mindset. So with that in mind, um, we're interviewing today uh, Brett Henning, who's um, uh, one of uh, the founding advisors for the Global Partnership and is one of the world's leading experts on citizen assemblies and the processes related to that. And we're very excited to have you here, Brett. So welcome. Thanks, Jim. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> so um, let's just dive right in and say, what, what do you think is wrong with our current status quo and politics and government around the world? Well, as, as you said there, Jim, uh, I think we are approaching multiple uh, icebergs if they if they weren't actually all melting as we approach them. Um, and I think what what's one thing that's uh, lacking is that the the deep and broad thinking that you talk about is not what you get uh, typically in a, you know, a Senate or a Congress or a parliament. Uh, you, you get people trying to score political points. You get people um, not being open to uh, evidence, to deliberation, et cetera. Um, I think they are obviously uh, have a very short-term view. They can't see beyond the next election often because they just have to win that next election. And if you're up for election every two years or every four years, then uh, that, that, that means looking beyond that into the, the long-term future is very hard. I think those groups are also fundamentally not representative of the, the population they're trying to um, uh, represent in, in, a, in a political sense. And although you could argue that's not important, I think it's crucially important for the, the voices that are being excluded from those processes. Um, and not to mention, of course, uh, the, the capture of many political systems by, by vested interests, powerful interests, the influence of money on that system. Uh, so I think there's, there's multiple problems, uh, meaning that we are not tackling the crises in front of us in a, uh, appropriately and with the necessary speed, essentially. So would, would you say that, um... Put your uh, idealist hat on and say that were you able to um, have all the players within the existing political systems, and let's let's for the purpose of this question assume sort of uh, democracies. Um, it, if the democracies, which by definition are let's say more representative than the non-democracies, um, and they're based on a uh, um, smaller Republican uh, representative democracy model or a parliamentary model, most of them, what could we optimize them? Could we strengthen all the existing and, and, and make sure all the existing pieces and make sure that they work as they were designed to work? Um, would that achieve the goal? And even if it would, can we, can, what are the chances of that? Um, the, the, uh, I could go on to a long uh, discussion of the history of the constitution making in the US and whether it was designed to work in the way it is working now or not. I think it's, uh, it's actually um, inertia that stops us changing these systems. And I don't actually think uh, historically they were designed to be represented. For example, in, in most places where they originally created parliaments, only men who paid a certain amount of tax could actually vote. They weren't actually designed to be representative of the population of the whole. For example, women were excluded. For example, before the Voting Rights Act, uh, people of color were typically excluded from voting. So I think there's a, a fallacy to say that the historical design, um, we're just uh, supporting that and building upon that. There are lots of proposals to tweak 
the, the system, of course. Um, there are people who are saying we should have more referendums, we should have more direct democracy, or there's people saying that we should create a new political party to uh, challenge the, 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 two, the two major parties, etc. Um, I can go into why I think that's the, the wrong approach. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, I think we need to fundamentally rethink how decisions are made and who they're serving, essentially. Brett, I'm going to edit this little bit out, but uh, your hands seem to keep touching something related to a microphone that's creating a back uh, scratchy sound. So, um, okay, so um, what are what are some of the things that people are doing? I, in the US, a lot of people are talking about rank choice voting right now, which is uh, akin to what happens in parliamentary systems with multiple parties, but uh, or, or has some of the advantages of that. But what are some of the other things that people are doing to try to uh, upgrade existing democracy? Yeah, uh, tweaking with the voting system is, is a common proposal. Uh, so ranked choice or in the UK, there's a campaign to run a proportional voting system. Uh, in Australia, we have the alternative vote, the alternate vote system and, and people do actually rank the choices. It still leads to more or less a two party system in Australia. Although um, the, the, the voting system is different in the Senate. So we have a more, more parties in the Senate. Um, I think elections themselves are, are, are fundamentally problematic. Uh, and this is, this is where I love your approach of looking at how systemic innovation could work, because I think it's actually the system of elections that's the problem. And how could we actually uh, change that is, is, is what I'm getting into. Um, the other stuff that people propose are, of course, a more Swedish, uh, not Swedish, sorry, Swiss model where referendums are really common and people get to have a more direct democratic input into the process. Um, I personally uh, am not a favor of that either because to me in an ideal democracy, what you go through is a process of informed deliberation where you get exposed to a wide range of expert views. You talk to people who have very different views of yourself and you try to come to a, uh, an understanding together. And I think referendums, instead of actually bringing people together, they, they divide people. Um, so yeah, uh, otherwise, of course, uh, tweaking with how campaign funding is done, putting limits on campaign funding. I think, again, that this, these tweaks in and of themselves could improve the system, but if you're looking at systemic innovations to really jump to a more fair and more just system, then I think uh, we've got to think outside those boxes. So, uh... In the US, and again, the global partnership is, is globally minded, but what happens fortunately or unfortunately, US often has a great impact in the world. It's a highly uh, uh, partisan environment right now. And um, it's really for the first time perhaps ever been a question of um, uh, the entire system is being manipulated to uh, be anti-democratic um, by, by some in the political system. Um, one of the things they're doing is voter suppression. Um, it's the idea that, you know, let's get fewer people involved in the voting or let's, let's uh, suppress certain target groups in, uh, from voting uh, so that one perspective can have a greater chance of, of victory or even ensure, <clears throat> ensure victory. So that just rubs uh, small d, democratically oriented people the wrong way, given what the struggle has been for so long, which is to have as, you know, full participation as much as possible as kind of a um, core ideal of, of democracy. Um, you know, one person, one vote. It's been an imperfect march and we're not fully there yet, but the idea is that was kind of the, that was the holy grail. And taking a step back is, is uh, you know, frustrating at the moment, but it's also frustrating in the lar larger scheme of history. Um, why not just focus on getting everyone involved in voting and all the things that can go with that? You know, I think it, it, to, to me, it gets back to the same critique that actually it's, it's fundamentally elections, that to win an election, you normally have to be a millionaire, perhaps a billionaire soon, 
to be able to, to pay for a campaign, you need to raise a war chest of money. So even if everyone could vote, the types of people that they are electing are very unlike the community themselves. For example, half of US senators are millionaires or something, whereas of course not half of the population is millionaires. Now, if you put a bunch of millionaires in a room and say, come up with a certain type of, uh, come up with a law on how to fund uh, education, schooling or something, I assume that would come up with a very different law that actually if you've got a representative bunch of people so um although of course uh everyone should have the opportunity to get involved and we we should make sure that those voting rights are, are held intact um i think to bring uh, a polarized society together there's this much better way which is to represent to randomly select this representative bunch of people this happened uh in an experiment recently called america in one room where they randomly selected 500 people a representative bunch and brought them together and the amazing thing you saw happen was that people from both sides of the political spectrum spoke to each other understood where each other was coming from and even if they didn't actually agree they at least walked out of that room going ah now i see why they're coming from that perspective this to me is is the democratic ideal about how we should be making decisions and so is to me why again i keep coming back to this uh, for me this systemic problem that elections themselves are fundamentally flawed uh, before, before we get to uh the new model that that you're championing um so let's go back to the idea okay so uh, you have elections and there's too much influence of money in politics from the cost of campaigns to the lobbying that goes on and so on and so forth. So why not then focus on uh, uh, full uh, maximum voting rights access and getting money out of politics? This, is, this has been the sort of one-two punch that people have been trying to, to do um that makes sense as a as a duo um because if you're not biasing the system towards uh existing power and privilege and you're getting everyone involved then that sounds like the ideals of democracy so for example in australia that we have compulsory uh voting so everyone has to vote so it's, it's not about uh trying to get everyone involved it's like by law you have to vote um, it doesn't lead to the ideal that for me is uh, of going through, uh, of having a, a access to a wide spectrum of information and actually confronting different views and having to explore the why of people's political views, which is, I think, where, where things get interesting. Um, also, in terms of having uh, limits on campaign funding, uh, they do have limits in various other countries across the world, but you still see the political class largely formed of typically older, typically male, typically richer people. And um, although these people claim to be responsive to the, the views of their, of their constituents, and of course, in theory, could always be voted out, depending on the electoral system, you may or may not have a choice. If there's two dominant political parties, and you 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 hate this one and you don't like that one <laughs> then yeah. which one do you vote for so um again this this tweaking and this is where you can get back to to ancient athens for example where uh, aristotle for example says elections are aristocratic devices um uh, this was repeated throughout the 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 french revolution um and, and up into the the time of writing the the, the u.s constitution as well people had read uh, philosophers saying that elections are aristocratic and they chose elections to run their system. So uh, we'll, we'll get back to that, uh, I'm sure a bit later, but what about the role of the media? So one could argue, um, or what we now call the media, we used to call mm -hmm. the press, the free press. So um, isn't it, if, if you could also strengthen and support and enhance uh, a free press, an independent, unofficial wing of the governmental process, which is sort of the, inf you, you, you mentioned information, the informational check and the educational catalyst for the electorate so that uh, they do a better job than has been happening. But they let's say that in theory, do a better job of providing information. We now have 
instant information to um, via the internet in ways that, that was not possible for most of the history of democracy. We've seen how it can be manipulated, but there's also an argument that it could be, you know, dramatically enhancing to the average person, let's say maybe not on any given day, but prior to elections, there could be certain things that um, uh, are done. And when people are willing to pay attention that uh, strengthen the average citizen's ability to make good decisions uh, and then do so collectively. Yeah. I mean, the, the, a free, independent media, absolutely crucial. Um, and I think the, the media's role in, in holding governments to account is, is essential and necessary, and we, we should do everything we can to strengthen that. Unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, um, the, the media is getting uh, controlled and compressed and controlled by smaller and smaller, larger corporations. So we're actually seeing the, the diversity of voices that dominate the, the media coverage is, is being narrowed. And of course, not to mention the, the sort of elephant in the room, which is social media and the way that people are quickly shifting to getting most of their news from, from social media, most of their news from, say, uh, Facebook or from Twitter, where these famous you know, filter bubbles or information cocoons happen, where you end up receiving information just from people who um, support your view and you end up getting your news from people who agree with you and actually the kind of internet utopian view that uh, the internet will open us up to a diversity of views, as far as I'm concerned, has been proven completely wrong. And if anything, it's actually closing and narrowing people's views down. So although I absolutely agree that the, the a free and independent press is really crucial um, in, in asking politicians how, to, how they justify, how they explain their decisions, I'm not at all confident that just with that mechanism, we can actually dig ourselves out of the, the, the crises we're in. Okay, so now that we've explored sort of your views on the state of things and, and uh, examined, you know, the pros and cons of, of from your perspective of, of alternatives that are uh, about improving the existing model. Um, you've been championing the uh, sortition model um, applied to citizen assemblies. Uh, let's let's hear about that. Why why are not only you so excited about this, but why are uh, others increasingly excited about this? Yeah, citizens assemblies, um, which uh, have have seen an enormous increase in the last sort of decade or so. In fact, the OECDC has done a study which they now call this the deliberative wave that they're seeing sort of sweep across the world. Um, the idea is, is quite simple, actually, that you randomly select a representative bunch of people um, that, a bit like a, a legal jury, in a sense, that this bunch of people will be put through an informed delivery process so that they will hopefully come to the decision that any randomly selected representative bunch of people, or in fact, the entire country, if they could go through an informed delivery process, would come to that same decision. So it's that kind of legal jury model but applied to politics. And so what we've seen now is that uh, in Ireland now, they've had three of these uh, events. In Scotland, they've had two and committed to having annual events. President Macron in France has had a national one. In Spain, they're having a national citizens assembly. In Austria, having a national citizens assembly. Um, we're seeing this, this event sweep the world. There's now a global citizens assembly happening uh, around the, the, the conference of parties to deal with the, the climate change, the UN event in Glasgow happening now. Um, and also local citizens assemblies. So they're happening at local, at national, even at global level. This model of bringing randomly selected representative bunches of people together to go through an informed delivery environment, which to me sort of captures these ideals of, of democracy that we would hope that the current system could do, but it's so patently failing to do. So could you walk us through what you think is the... Uh, and, and the best actual case that's happened or is happening now and how, what are the practical issues, uh, logistical, also resistance, sort of give us an ex a, a case study. So Ireland would have to be the most famous uh, case studies. I think it's, it's a bit of a poster child for citizens assemblies at the moment because they've had 
highly controversial issues such as abortion, such as same-sex marriage. And this country, traditionally strongly Catholic country, but also uh, quite divided in, and polarized in their views, have decided that these topics, they're, they're, they're too hot for politicians to actually be able to even touch. And there's so much emotion, there's so many um, powerful bodies trying to pull uh, the politicians in one way or the other way and threatening their electoral chances. So, I mean, this, you could call it the hot potato effect, if you like. Uh, and what, what they've done is they've said, right, we're going to give this topic to a citizens assembly to debate. And uh, the citizens assemblies have met uh, 99 people randomly selected to be representative island. And they go through a very long process of listening from experts, listening to people who's had their lives affected by these issues. Um, they also have an open submission process. So of course, people outside that can, can submit uh, reports or petitions, et cetera. And a, a summary of those get presented to these people. Again, they then go through the process, they deliberate, they try to understand why other people have different views, and then they come up uh, with a decision and they make that decision. Um, that has then led to, to famous referendums in, in Ireland on those topics. Um, what are the issues around this? At the moment, of course- By the way, before you go further, so um, who, who was, uh... Was everyone in favor of these citizen assemblies in Ireland or were some of the parties not in favor because they thought this might open the door for change? And did any of the parties that were against citizen assemblies shift by their own accord or through pressure because other people found the process compelling? Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question, Jim. Very interestingly, when they were proposing to talk about the, the Irish constitutional ban on abortion in a citizens assembly, both sides of that debate came out against it. Um, and so the church came out against it, perhaps out of fear that the, the, the status quo would change, but also the, the pro-choice movement came out against it because they thought that this process would be too slow, it would be kicking the can down the road, that it might never resolve and they might not get anything out of that. Of course, in hindsight, they, they've seen the result and they've swung completely around uh, and they think that was a great way to deal with these, these events. The politicians themselves, I think after the first um, Citizens' Assembly in Ireland, which was actually a constitutional convention, they had a third of the seats in that were full of politicians and they thought they needed to include politicians in that assembly. After they'd done it once, the second citizens assembly had no politicians in it. And I think they just realized that actually a random bunch of everyday people selected to be representative come up with great ideas. They, they come up with, with valuable proposals that people can use. Um, so the across the political spectrum, I think they now more or less see in Ireland, they see citizens assemblies as a really useful tool. And I think we're seeing the same happen in Scotland as well. Now that they've held their second citizens assembly, after those first two, they were like, wow, these are amazingly powerful events. Let's have a regular citizens assembly. And so they've committed now to having an annual citizens assembly there as well. So originally, even if there was political party opposition or wider social opposition, many groups are now seeing this as a way forward, a way to open up political um, space for change and of kind of breaking the chains that hold back politicians from actually making these tough decisions. Did it uh, create some more political harmony or uh, is it really on, in this case, these are citizen assemblies on single issues, so to speak, that are difficult for society and therefore the whole question of, you know, political harmony might not be able to be um, uh, expanded to the larger uh, body politic over time. Yeah, um, I don't see the, the elected officials um, outside of these narrow areas behaving any, any more civilly to each other. Um, I, I think, of course, because they're still very interested in being the next government, in, in winning the next election. So they, uh, in other spheres, anytime a proposal comes up, I haven't seen 
the sort of informed delivery process that citizens assemblies go through reflected whatsoever in an elected chamber. Um, yeah, so I don't think uh, it hasn't had a healing influence on traditional politics, although potentially there's more support for using this as a tool to address complex issues in a sort of apolitical way. So you mentioned earlier this idea about in Ireland in this example that we're looking at um, issues that are quote unquote too hot to handle. Mm. So um, is this now a selling point, a feature that can be used to pitch the idea of citizen assemblies um, on the one hand and on the other hand, is there now a lesson that uh, someone's going to win and someone's going to lose compared to the status quo. And so the one hand you could pitch politicians in general and say, hey, if no progress is happening on something and it's forcing you as a politician to, uh, to continually uh, position yourself relative to these hot button issues when you want to look at other issues as well, but you're, but these are so hot that that's what everyone focuses on, kind of litmus test questions. Um, but on the other hand, the idea is, so that's an advantage. Let's, let's not kick the can into the future. Let's kick the can over to the people. Um, or let's avoid this because actually these things work. They work at making progress and we, pro, lack of progress can sometimes be, uh, uh, you know, fertile soil for uh, political engagement, as as people as parties or certain politicians might tap frustration as a source of engagement rather than aspiration. Mm. Uh, it does seem that um, politicians enjoy making it hard for <laughs> for each other to to make progress on any complex decision and any complex problems. Um, to me, again, this is a result of of the the nature of elections. You have to undermine your opposition at every possible chance, and if that means frustrating any possible progress on any topic. That will potentially make you look good, and so this is this is one of these fundamental flaws of the political process. Um, having said that, I think every politician that you approach, if you ask them, "Is there a complex problem you'd love to deal with, and you've been blocked from doing so?" They would all have a, a topic. They could all say, "Yeah, I was." my dream was to deal with and it could be anything it could be redeveloping this piece of land over there that has all these different people trying to demand and propose solutions for it and so as a selling point of breaking open the system and coming out with a, a fixed proposal sure that that's what citizens assemblies are great for um it's essentially any topic that is is so political or so or so politicized that that there won't be any trust that a, a political party's proposal is not just designed to only benefit their supporter base. Um, climate change specifically has seen uh, an explosion of citizens' assemblies in the UK, at least, also on a local level. And I think a lot of that is um, people realizing that, okay, we know there's lots of different policy options of how to tackle climate change. They will all have pros and cons. They will all help in some way, but they'll all have a negative impact on our lifestyle, on uh, you know whether we can fly, whether we can drive, et cetera, et cetera. And no politician, again, is ready to make that call. And so giving that to a citizens' assembly where they can debate the pros and cons, and you can find out that after a group of people go through this informed process, two thirds of them are actually willing to sacrifice certain things in their life to, to make that gain, then that can give you the confidence to, to go ahead. For example, there was a citizens assembly on aged care in the UK and the citizens assembly came out proposing to raise taxes on more elderly wealthy people. No politician would ever make that proposal, it would be like political suicide. But having that there proposed by this, through this informed delivery process, opens up that space. It hasn't happened yet. Um, but yeah, as soon as I think more politicians cotton on that it's actually a way of 
letting them move forward on things that they've been blocked to, I think more politicians will come to using these tools, actually. So um, I was about to ask you, uh, and I'd still like to ask you, uh, how do these randomly selected citizens get selected? I assume not everyone says yes. But before we get to that, or maybe you can work, weave that into your answer, let's start historically. Um, this, process, this idea has been around for a long time, since ancient Greece, um, where democracy itself was, was uh, uh, born. So uh, what's the history of this in the, in the distant past? And how is the selection process made to take that ancient idea and update it for today's world? Yeah, so in, in ancient Greece, in ancient Athens specifically, uh, and let's not, let's not rose color it, there was, there was slavery, uh, women were excluded from the process completely, um, and only citizens of Athens could participate. And so that was actually quite a small number of people in Athens, actually, um, and, and of course, uh, adults. But they had this direct democratic system where every free male Athenian could go to and they could debate the, the political topic of the day. Surrounding that direct democratic system was hundreds of post positions uh, and they were virtually all randomly selected. So random selection was seen as a key component of every body sitting around that forum from the bodies that actually drafted the legislation to of course uh, the juries and the judges that is where we get our legal random section for juries from um, and all the other bodies around that were random selected they had a random selection device and you can go to the museums in in athens and see you know the, the remains of one of these random selection devices that they would use a, a very um, clever system of white balls and black balls on a tube that meant that you could also make sure that one person from each region was also chosen from the 10 or however many reasons there were in, in Athens. Um, so that's why you read things in, for example, Aristotle, where he says uh, elections are aristocratic, uh, democracy means lottery. And then roll forward in history, you get Montesquieu and Rousseau saying exactly the same thing. Democracy is lottery, election means aristocracy. Um, and then the first political systems, of course, that had elections, yeah, only very rich men could actually vote and stand for office. So they weren't actually called democratic at all. They were called variously Republican, or they were called um, the different names. And slowly the franchise expanded to include more and more people. And then at some point it got labeled democracy. But this is a uh, this was a long pro historical process. So the actual modern sort of rediscovery. Actually, before we before we get that, you mentioned something that I, I'd love to explore a little more historically. Yep. So um, we understand the idea of the jury drawn from the citizenry yep. for for uh, the courtroom. Um, for we understand the idea that that. Is, is there's something very intuitively appealing about that for justice. Um, the idea that we could all be in the docket, we could all be accused of something. So the idea of you know, innocence until proven guilty, um, the idea of you know, being given uh, a chance to have a representative advocate for you um, uh, so that the facts are presented in the best possible light if you're not capable of doing that. And then the idea that your peers, <clears throat> something very appealing about that, your peers, meaning horizontal, co-equal, mm -hmm. uh, can decide uh, your fate based, based on the facts. Um, and there needed to be, at least in the US, a dozen, um, you know, the idea that there's some kind of critical number above which you can get uh, good decisions and below which maybe it's not gonna be, there's not as much uh, diversity of opinion. Um, so, uh, and, and, and also in the system you have tweaks like the, you know, the, the fact that you need unanimity about certain things in certain kinds of cases and you don't in other kinds of cases, um, uh, particularly ca cases that involve incarceration, you need you know, mm -hmm. unanimity. The consequences are greater. Mm -hmm. So 
that survived you said what 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 is it about the jury system that has survived um that really never went away um and the other bits didn't survive and are there any lessons for us in the current moment about that mm. I, mean, I think that what's what's appealing and don't get me wrong i think the the jury system has obvious problems as well especially the way you can vet juries and choose who is on the on the jury and who is not etc and of course the way evidence is presented is caught in in court there's lots of issues there as well but i think the fundamental thing that appeals about a legal jury is this fact that it's a randomly selected bunch of people um your peers as you say a trial by your peers who have no um, a priori interest in the outcome of this case. They're just going to judge the case on the merits of the evidence. Then they're going to chat to each other. They're going to deliberate in a in a room about it, and they're going to come to a decision. And that this idea that that twelve people would come to the same decision any twelve people would come to, and that's exactly where the the citizens assembly idea leaps from as well. It just says right. Let's get 50, 100, 150, however many people. The numbers actually aren't so important. What's more important is that they actually go through an, an informed, deliberative process where they have to talk to each other about their ideas. Um, what other parts? I mean, that's why I think that the jury model has appealed, because, of course, you don't want to just open up and say, hey, who wants to be on the jury? And the people who put their hand up can be on the jury. That would just be ridiculous. And you certainly wouldn't have an election. Let's vote for who's going to be on the jury to, to make these decisions. That would also be ridiculous. Um, so I think this, there's some fundamental fairness as well about random selection, of course. You know, it could be you. Uh, and of course, some people don't like uh, serving on jury duty. And as you hinted before, some people might, might not like to be chosen to talk about a political issue. Um, and if you want me to connect that to your earlier question about how we do choose these people, it's, it's typically a two-step process. So in the first step, we send out tens of thousands of invitations. And those people are randomly selected from the best database you have. If that's the electoral roll, great. If that's a postal address uh, database, great. In some countries in Central Europe, they actually have a residence register. So every resident in the country is on this register and you can just randomly select people from that reg residence register. Those people get an invitation. As you say, some people don't respond. Of course, these events at the moment, they typically take up a lot of time. They typically happen on weekends. Um, so, you know, obviously, if you've got young kids or if you work on weekends, that's going to be problematic. We try to reduce the barriers at the moment as much as we can. So often their, their um, participation is paid. Often we offer funds for childcare or for time off work, etc. And of course, offer support on actually um, getting to the Citizens Assembly or participating online. From those who... You go uh, further. So it, yep. it, just to understand that bit. So you talked about, you know, we don't want to ask everyone and then see who raises their hand. But when you send out tens of thousands of invitations, the ones who reply are the ones who, in effect, raise their hand. So uh, it, 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 has there been an, any studied or uh, anecdotally detected bias in the kinds of people who say yes? Not that we've seen. There has been a study into, there has been one published paper where they went and asked people why they didn't reply. And in fact, the reasons they didn't reply were exactly the reasons you'd suspect that uh, weekends are precious. I don't need the money. I've got young kids. Um, you know, it, it wasn't anything dramatic or anything that was actually feasible to address without actually legislating that you must attend of course and that you would get paid time off work to attend like you do if you're you're joining a jury of course if we move to a serious institutionalized form you may look at making it mandatory or not there's there's various pros and cons of, of, of what that would be it might be um, much greater i suppose in that situation too yeah yeah it'd be it'd be interesting it's an interesting debate um at the moment, because uh, they are not mandatory, of course, we can't force anyone. We just try to uh, lower the bound barriers as much as we can. But when you randomly select addresses and only invite those people, 
you get a very different bunch of people who respond to what you would see turn up to an open meeting. So absolutely, there is a level, there is self-selection in that step, but it's a very different self-selection to when you have, say, an open town hall meeting on, you know, developing the park down the road where the people who turn up will only more or less be people who care passionately about that park. And it'll be very hard to have a sort of civilized, rational discussion about what's best for that park. Um, when you send out random invites, you get a very different type of person who responds. Um, of course, there is always some skewing towards the more highly educated, um, often middle age uh, people. So what we then do is we do a second step where we correct that skewing to make sure that the sample that eventually sits down together is a representative microcosm across age, across gender, across socioeconomic um, and, and geography, of course. So this sort of two-step random selection means that it's absolutely not your usual suspects sitting in the room of people who are strongly ideological, who already think they know what's best for, for them, for the, their community. And so typically you have this really powerful conversation that you just wouldn't see at a, at a town hall meeting where people are more confrontational, more fixed in their ways. There's um, an academic in the US, Jim Fishkin, who actually measures the change in opinion of people going through an informed deliberative process. And this is very impressive. So he, he asks people on the way in, what's your opinion? He go, they go through a process of informed deliberation about a topic. He asks them, what's your opinion now? And he measures how many people shift and how much. And of course, there's always a hard core who will never shift from their initial position. They're, they're absolutely sure of their views. But there is a substantial middle who are like, wow, yeah, sure. I never thought of that issue this way. I didn't know those facts. And, and now I think like this. And this is, to me, what shows that citizens' assemblies are so much better than, for example, elections or referendum. Getting people to go through this informed process, uh, it just, it's, it's a win-win for society, as far as I'm concerned. Um, talk a little bit about that change of opinion. So how big has he found what's the the range of opinion change and are there certain issues that lent types of issues that lend themselves to citizen assembly informed discussion from average citizen discussions versus um, expert testimony to elected representatives discussions mm -hmm. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers. It was it was ten years ago when I was looking at these these numbers. Um, I do vaguely remember it was quite topic uh, specific. So on some topics people changed a lot. On some topics people changed very little. Um, the numbers. No, I'd just be inventing numbers if I pretended to tell you some numbers. Um, in terms of what topics are good, it's a yes no topic is not a good example typically. Um, uh, what you actually want is uh, a topic that people agree is a problem, but they can't agree on the solution. And potentially, there might already exist five different proposals for different solutions, and each of those proposals has pros and cons. And so what you want to essentially measure is, after going through this process, which of these topics are people willing to live with the, the downsides of that proposal um, to get the benefits. So for an example, in, in Cambridge in the UK, they had a citizens assembly on congestion and there was various proposals. We could charge, you could, we could have a congestion charge in the city center. We could close city streets. We could um, charge people more for parking, et cetera. And all these different topics. And they also talked about how to fund each of the, the proposals. So each proposal had a cost. And they said we could fund that through raising money like this or raising money like this. And it was really interesting to see the outcomes of that proposal, of that uh, deliberation. People like, because everything has a negative side. If you close streets, that's really annoying. You've got to make sure ambulances and fire trucks can get through. People will get frustrated. If you increase parking charges, that will affect the elderly as well as the, uh, the wealthy, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, the, these kind of topics where there's multiple options but people agree something has to be done uh, are the perfect topics. And so that's why I think climate change is, is really perfect in a sense. Uh, 
talk a little bit about um, your current work with the Sortition Foundation. Um, I imagine, given what you said at the beginning, and that I'm aware that citizen assemblies are, uh, you know, really hot these days, um, uh, or at least from a curiosity perspective, um, and in some cases an implementational perspective. But what, um, what's the the biggest project that you're working on right now or is it or is potentially in the works uh i know you're doing some stuff in scotland maybe you want to talk about that but i mean that would be viewed by the entire world as a as a test case at a at a high level um particularly if it was institutionalized um as opposed to a, a case by case or one-off sort of thing um what's going on there so some of the biggest case, uh, topics we've worked on, uh, the UK, five parliamentary committees in the UK Parliament uh, came together and uh, organised a Citizens' Assembly on Climate Change, and we worked on that project. Uh, we've also worked on uh, assemblies in Scotland. Um, and as you say, what's really interesting now is we are seeing a shift from sort of one-off ad hoc Citizens' Assemblies on one topic here, one topic there, one topic here, to some governments in the world saying, right, we need to use this on a regular basis. So Ireland is now more or less committed to using citizens' assemblies on a regular basis. Scotland, the, 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 the two parties that are forming the government in Scotland have issued an agreement saying that they will have an annual citizens' assembly in Scotland. So we've moved from ad hoc to regular. For us, the next thing is to move it from regular to institutionalized. Because as you say, at the moment, they're just advisory. So they make their report, they give it to the government. Uh, the government can ignore that or respond as they see fit at the moment. So we would much rather that actually be uh, an integral part in the, in the democratic, pro democratic process. So in Scotland, we're running a campaign that builds on something that happened in East Belgium, in the, in the German speaking part of East Belgium. Um, there's a, a parliament there in, in Eupen, Ostbelgen, and that parliament has set up a permanent randomly selected citizens council to sit alongside the parliament. Um, that council chooses a handful of topics every year that they think a citizens assembly should deal with, and then independent citizens assemblies are held on each of those topics. We are now campaigning in Scotland for the Scottish Parliament, which is a single chamber of parliament, to be accompanied by a House of Citizens. So this would, in a sense, be a, a permanent citizens assembly. Of course, perhaps every six months, you would replace half of those people and people would might serve on for one year, perhaps two years. So you would have this rotation through a permanent randomly selected body that had real political power. So that's our aim. What sort of um, power might they have? So they could, they could be, in a sense, become like a Senate. You, I mean, there's various discussions about exactly what power they would have. Would they have uh, just power to um, query legislation as it passed through that Senate? Would they have power to send it back to the, the, the first chamber to modify if they thought that it wasn't adequate? Would they have power to instigate their own um, legislation? That's taking it to a whole new level. Um, at the first, we think there's, there's points in the legislative process, particularly early on, where such a chamber could form a really uh, useful function. You have a draft idea, some draft legislation, you send it to this chamber, they put it through an informed delivery process and say, yeah, we like this, no, we don't like that. And not only if they like it or not, but why and why it's appealing and why it's not appealing. And that could then go back to the first chamber for, for further work. Um, so this campaign is ongoing. There is some expressed interest within the Scottish Parliament and there are various civil society organisations such as the Electoral Reform Society, uh, Commonweal, who are coming out in, in support of this campaign. And um, we'll just, we're just building on that. And hopefully at some point in the future, you'll hear about a, the first ever citizen Senate or House of Citizens, if you like. <clears throat> Thank you. I have, I have two, uh, we're going to wrap up soon, but I have two, two questions. So we talked about, to date, these have been almost all advisory bodies, these as citizen assemblies, um, but they carry a huge amount of credibility. It is one thing to have a pressure group um, 
with you know, 200,000 members in a country, I'm making up a country, 200,000 members in a country of 20 million, and, uh, but very active 200,000, sort of the traditional model, and you don't, and, and politicians saying, I don't want to piss them off. Um, they're very active voting population. Uh, they show up at all the meetings, they, they get a lot of press and so on. So they have outsized influence compared to their percentage of the total population. Uh, 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 commensurate to the, their level of passion on the issue, um, which some people, by the way, argue is is a legitimate thing to be taken account. In other words, if people really care that much, then then let them have more influence than the people who don't really care that much. Um, but uh, when governments have gotten these proposals developed by citizen assemblies, with the argument that this may be two hundred people. But it's 200 people that are demographically representative of 20 million people. Um, so just like polling is a sampling, um, especially when it's scientific random polling, which has some parallels here, um, it has more credibility. It's seen as a more credible poll. And it can be, you know, plus or minus a few percent whenever they would pick anyone else randomly and compare it. So it's it, there's a lot of history of the random selection process and the math behind it, showing that 200 people can give you a big clue about what 20 million people think. Mm -hmm. So when you have these advisor groups that are representative, even though they're small groups, and there's a lot of credibility to the idea of the small groups being representative, if the selection process is done very uh, regular, rigorously, when politicians ignore the recommendations, on what basis do they do that? And in other side of the coin, what sort of pressures do they feel given the legitimacy of the process as representative to accept the recommendations? I think the, the French uh, climate assembly is probably the best uh, example to refer to in this respect. Um, so after the, the French government tried to increase the, the tax on diesel and whatever else happened, but the, the yellow vest protests erupted week after week of, of protests and um, near riots on the, on the streets of Paris and around France, President Macron said, oh, <laughs> hot potato issue, let's give this to a citizens assembly, and he did, and so they randomly selected 150 people, brought them together from all the, all the areas of France, and got them to discuss uh, climate change in France. And the um, Prime Minister of France at some point came out and said, we are going to take your proposals word for word and put them into, into the parliament for, for debate. Um, when they actually came up with their proposals, the uh, President Macron, he vetoed three of them out of a lot, like out of 120 proposals or something like that, I can't remember the exact number, he vetoed a very small number and said, no, um, I'm not going to put those on the table. And he gave reasons. Fair enough. Um, he then put the rest in, in Parliament. And my understanding of what then happened was that the typical political process, which is one party saying we support this and therefore the other party saying, well, if you support it, we can't support it because we have to say no to everything that you say yes to. And so then it just got bogged down in the political process. Um, what happened at that point was very interesting because one, something like 70% of the, the adult population in France knew about the climate assembly and knew what was going on and knew about these proposals. And so there was a real um, large awareness of what was going on. And two, the 150 members of the group formed their own sort of political advocacy movement saying, you randomly selected us to talk about this. We spent months of our life talking about this, looking at all the detailed um, ins and outs and pros and cons of every option. And here's the considered view of this representative bunch of people. Now listen to it. Um, so it was a really interesting contrast between one powerful politician saying, yes, we'll listen word for word, the political parties tearing that apart, and then the, the people randomly selected, transforming themselves into a social movement demanding that they be listened to. Um, it never really got resolved. Uh, what did happen was a piece of legislation went through that apparently included, by a sort of rough estimate, about 40% of the proposals. 
So what happens to those other 60% of proposals is, is no one really knows. And so it's this sort of gray area where although people trust citizens assemblies and they see them as having a high level of legitimacy, it can often get stuck in the quagmire of typical electoral politics. And that's, I mean, that's exactly why our demand is to institutionalize these. We don't want them to be merely advisory. We actually want them to have real teeth. So that brings me to my final question. Uh, and after that, I just have a little bit of clothing or closing remarks. But so um, you, you've said something a few times, you know, sort of contrasting this approach to elections. Um, and not only intellectually uh, and philosophically, but uh, viscerally, I have a reaction against that. Um, I, I, I don't know if I've been socialized to the point where I'm pro-elections, but um, uh, I find it, let's separate it from me and my visceral re reaction and just say that there's a good chance that I'm not the only one with that feeling. <laughs> so um, if if that's the case then what we're feasibly looking at is an as from your perspective as an aspirational situation would be some combination within institutions given your last point yeah. of um, representative traditional electoral democracy paired with citizen assemblies absolutely so that's what so so what it, are, are you, would you acknowledge that we're going to keep elections and we want to not have this be the, this uh, citizen assembly thing, the magic fix, but there's still these other issues we talked about in the beginning that could upgrade the integrity of our, of, of elections um, and the electoral process um, to make it optimal within what you describe as its constraints paired with citizen assemblies is that where you think things could head and would you be satisfied with that uh that's definitely our aim at the moment we completely understand that um elections in people uh, elections equals democracy in most people's minds today um and this is why when we're campaigning we are almost always campaigning for a bicameral system. So we imagine an elected chamber and a sortition chamber. And we think this would also be uh, great for people to actually see. They could then compare how these two chambers behave, what kind of decisions these uh, chambers come. They could see if they're always at loggerheads, if a randomly selected bunch of people going through an informed process disagree all the time with an elected bunch of representatives and why. Um, so I think this actual bicameral model where you institutionalize in, in two chambers is, is a perfect stepping stone, <laughs> dare I say, or at least a point where people could then evaluate the benefits and the negative aspects of institutionalizing these things. Um, certainly at this point in time to say to people, we're going to take the vote away from you <laughs> is, is completely infeasible. And I think while elections I would support but yeah <laughs> absolutely and most people while elected chambers exist and while elections exist absolutely we have to try to fix that system we have to try to make those as representative as possible we have to i mean i'm an advocate of quotas in electoral systems for example um let's try to make sure that 50 percent of the people who are elected are women that would be very interesting um uh, let's try to make sure that they also have other uh, ways of representing the population uh, other than just supposedly listening to the voice of their constituents. Um, so absolutely, you know, let's try to fix electoral politics. It's not going anywhere soon, that's for sure. Um, but let's also try to set up institutionalized uh, delivery of democracy uh, using sortition. Thank you. So I'd like to just wrap up with a few comments. Um, uh, as you know, Brett, the Global Partnership for Civic Engagement has um, as one of its goals to eventually hold um, a global representative online uh, citizens assembly um, as a companion piece to our process of identifying the best systemic innovations on the main aspects of civilization and helping them scale up with resources. But I also think that it's important that we eventually have um, the all hands on deck 
piece of this where we can filter through um, these, the ideas and the uh, support with uh, general representative enthusiasm um, so that we can distill the highest shared aspirational values um, and pair them with the practical initiatives. Um, and uh, we, we call the, the first one will hold World Congress One. Uh, we hope to hold that uh, within the next uh, 18 months or so, um, pending progress on the, on, on the other things that we're doing, which are uh, uh, getting off the ground nicely now. Um, I, I just also want to close by saying that uh, although I don't agree always with everything that you're advocating for, um, I champion the idea of rethinking some of the uh, uh, sacred, um, quote unquote, sacred uh, assumptions about how we need to organize a fair society. Um, as I said in the beginning, a large number of people might have a different idea of what we should do, but we're at an inflection point in, in uh, global history where a large, very large percentage of the population sense that humanity as a whole and our global civilization um, is not on the right track or it's not up to the task of the challenges we have to face. And I often say that um, uh, when you have a set of challenges and you develop strategies that are not up to the scale of the problem or the challenge, it is by definition problematic. When you have existential crises, such as climate change, or when you have a lot of interrelated and interconnected issues, income inequality and, and sort of ongoing, a whole series of issues that constantly are talked about as unacceptable, and yet we try to make a dent with them every year and call it victory. Um, if you're trying to solve problems with a solution that's not up to the scale of the problem, the problem is existential or it's unacceptable, then I think it's unethical because you're knowingly trying to, you're, you're, you're enabling the perpetuation of a solution or you're knowing that you're not gonna really solve it. So I, I champion uh, systemic innovators like yourself who provoke the rest of us to think about how we can uh, integrate that dissatisfaction and use it as a uh, catalyst for structural innovation in practical terms for the entire civilization. Um, and I think that that's the point we are in history and that's why we need the systemic innovators uh, more than ever. So on that note, I wanna thank you for your, for your time today and uh, for what you're trying to do in the world. And um, I hope to speak with you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jim.